our son was in elementary school. He's in fifth grade. We had moved fairly recently, so we'd only been in the area a couple of months. And I got off of work, and I had a few minutes between picking him up and um, between getting home, picking him up. So I ran home. I did a couple chores, and I left my work clothes on, my, my dress shirt and my blazer. But then I decided to put on some really bright, hot pink flannel pajama pants and Christmas socks, and then I just went to the carpool line and thought, this is fine. No one will know. When the teacher comes out, you know, business on top, party on bottom, she's never going to know. So I'll just get the kid, go home, throw on a T-shirt. So I'm in the carpool line, and I'm hearing this sound that is really, really loud. And then I see people, like, waving me down, and I'm like, ah, it's so friendly here. Hi. And then finally a teacher comes over, a, a male teacher, naturally. He's panicked because he's like, do you have a husband? He's not going to be happy with this news. So he's pounding on the window, and he's like, hey, you have a really, really flat tire. And I was like, oh, okay, thanks. And I just rolled my window back up. So I thought, well, I'm, no way am I getting, I don't even have shoes. No way am I getting out of this car in front of hundreds of people that I'm going to see again because I look like I just escaped from mental hospital. So I just kept driving in the line slowly, very slowly. So the man comes back over because he thinks I didn't understand. So he pounds on the window again. Hey, hey, you're going to really tear up your rim. You should not be driving on that tire. So I just said, oh, the tire. Okay, thanks. And then I rolled my window up. And went all the way through the rest of the line, down the street, around the corner, and called Oscar and said, hey, I think I just messed up my rim (laughs) because I drove for a long time. So he was all like, why? Why wouldn't you just get out? It's no big deal. You should have just gotten out. You should have pulled over. And then when he pulls up to help me, he took one look at me and said, oh, I get it. I get why you didn't want to get out like that. I was not at all prepared. And a lot of times I don't have my cell phone. So if I hadn't had it with me, I probably would have driven the five miles all the way home on that tire because I was just not ready for what I encountered. But I'm not the only one. We're going to read a story in the Bible today about someone that was really, really unprepared. It's the parable of the 10 virgins. Matthew 25, parable of the 10 virgins. Now I'm going to tell you, I grew up in church. And so whenever I heard this story, When I was younger, I thought that this story was about 10 virgins who were going to marry the bridegroom, which I always thought was kind of weird. Like, why would Jesus tell a parable about 10 virgins getting married when he really seemed to be into men having one wife and not 10? But it turns out that virgins are the bridesmaids. They're not the actual bride. (laughs) So the virgins, just in case you share my confusion, the bridegroom is not coming to marry all 10 virgins. I feel like we should make that clear. But there are 10 virgins virgins who are waiting. So Matthew 25, we're going to start right at verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke and tr- woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they reply, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Heavenly Father, we invite you into this place. We pray for your anointing on me as I preach and the anointing on the ears of those who are listening to receive and hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is a parable. It's just a story Jesus is telling to illustrate a spiritual principle about being ready to meet him. You have 10 virgins. They're getting ready to meet the bridegroom. They take their lamps out. They're waiting on him, and some are not as ready as they should have been. So it's pretty easy to read this story, right, and say, I'm so glad I'm not one of the foolish virgins. I'm so glad that I'm ready. I'm so glad I'm prepared. But the truth is, until the moment the bridegroom came, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins, that is a harder word for me to say than I realized, um, they were all doing the exact same thing. 
They were going through the same motions. So what that tells me is that I'm not ready based on the actions that I go through. So I'm not ready to meet the bridegroom just because I come to church on Sunday or just because I raise my hands in worship or just because I repost a scripture on Facebook. I'm not ready unless I have relationship because it's not about professing relationship. It's about possessing it. Hear me. It's not about just saying you have it. It's about really having it. And so what happens sometimes in our Christian walk is we kind of sort of know about Jesus and we settle for that instead of actually really knowing him. And so, you know, um, in my role at Alternatives, I'm the executive director at Alternatives Pregnancy Center, and occasionally I will speak in front of groups. I had the privilege of speaking in front of a group yesterday, and and then people want to tell me sometimes who they know. But I love this about Iowa. They tell me through like a family tree. I get a genealogy. It's, I just need to get out a pen and draw it. So they'll be like, hey, you spoke at a church a year ago and my third cousin was there. Her name is Sandy. Oh, I don't remember Sandy. No, no, no. You don't, you don't know Sandy. But then her daughter called you two days later and then her cousin sent you an email and then they sent you a friend request on Facebook and she has blonde hair. You know who I'm talking about? Um, maybe, (laughs) probably not though. (laughs) So you get this kind of like, I know you, but really, really, I don't know you, right? And this is how it works sometimes in the Christian walk that we say, oh, I'm so secure because I'm around people that know Jesus and that's good enough for me. And what he's saying in this parable is a really hard truth that not everybody who thinks they're going to heaven is going to heaven. So we can't really be put out when the word of God tells us something about ourselves, right? So when we read the word of God, it tells us how we're supposed to resolve conflict, how we're supposed to live at peace with one another, how we're supposed to pursue the holy things of God. We can't really be put out when it tells us something that we don't want to hear. And so when he says, not everyone who thinks they're going to heaven should be going to heaven, does that make us live in fear? Does that make us question our salvation? Friends, yes, it should if you're living for yourself, if you're going through the motions, if there's not authentic relationship, yes, we should step back and say, do I really know God or do I only know about him? But when we say, I know him, I know who he is, I know what he's done for my life, I have a personal relationship with him. So when I knock on the door, he won't say, I don't know you. I don't just know him, he knows me. So our security is in our relationship with Christ, not in what we do, not in outward signs, because these virgins did the exact same thing until the minute that the bridegroom came. You could not have looked at their lamps initially and been able to tell the difference who was prepared and who wasn't. So some of the virgins fell asleep because they were at peace, because they knew they were ready, and others fell asleep because they thought they had more time. So in verse 9, the bridegroom comes. It's here. It's time. And the ones without oil look at the ones who have and say, give me some of your oil. And I've always thought this part of Scripture is interesting because they say, no, go get your own. (laughs) Go get your own oil. Well, that doesn't feel very Christian, right? Sure, here's a little of my oil. No way. (laughs) Go get your own oil. Family, can I tell you that sometimes we're a little like that? When we come into the body of Christ on Sunday and we say, I haven't read my word all week. I've not been in scripture. Pastor, preach a good sermon because I need some of your oil. I haven't worshiped all week. I have not thanked God once this week. Hannah, play good on the guitar. I need some of your oil, right? You know, I'm going to come into church and um, Karen, you better greet me because I need some of your oil. I'm going to come to celebrate recovery, and I'm going to expect that the people that come there are going to set me free because, Connie, I need some of your oil. And we come in, and our oil is empty, and we look around, and we say, I need some of yours. Pastor Dan, I'm going to bring my kids on Wednesday night. Now, listen, we fight in front of them at home. We don't preach the word. We watch things we shouldn't. We say things we shouldn't. But I'm going to drag those kids in here on Wednesday night, and you better pour your oil all over them and make sure that they know Jesus. And that's not how it works. Friends, your oil is your responsibility. Can I tell you that so many roots of bitterness that I've seen and godly men and women come from this this belief that my oil is your job to fill. And when you don't, then I get mad at you. Well, I can't worship. They're not anointed. They're not supposed to fill your oil. And you're not worshiping them, so why does it matter if they are or they aren't? 
Is God who he said he was? Is he the king of kings and lord of lords? Then it shouldn't matter if every note they sing is wrong and they're worshiping in Chinese because it doesn't change who God is, right? And so I don't come saying, here's my empty oil worship team. Do something to inspire me. No way. Friends, the oil in your lamp is your responsibility. And that's hard to hear because, listen, the only way that we can fill our oil is through relationship with Christ. But when we start looking at other people and we start saying, I'm feeling the way I am and you need to do something about it, what we're saying is, I know how to get to the cross, but I'd rather go to you instead. And I want a poor substitution for the presence of God, which won't really help, right? And so... Wednesday night, we had a little kiddo who started crying. She wasn't feeling good in her class. Rachel texted me and said, hey, I think we've got an ear infection. So I take her to the ER, and we're sitting there, and we're waiting on the doctor, and she's in a significant amount of discomfort. And so I'm, she's like, I need something. I need something. I need. Well, there's no doctor. There's no nurse. They were busy with another emergency, and I don't have anything. So I just, I'm improvising, right? So I have some hard candy in my purse. Do you want some of this medicine? <laughs> it might help. <laughs> it's, um, let me read it. So I'm looking at it. It's cherry. I'm like, it's cherry. Maybe that will help your ear. <laughs> it bought us a few minutes here and there. In case you wonder how the story ends, she didn't have an ear infection. She put something in her ear. And as it turns out, that hurts just as bad. So once they pulled it out, we are all good. <laughs> she said, my brain told me to do it. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, he said it starts with a thought. So he was right. So we were there. Um, but, you know, I'm giving her these poor substitutions, this something. It's a stopgap. It's not the real cure. Friends, I can tell you that when you come empty and dry and you look around and say, who is going to fill my lamp for me? It is a stopgap and it is not the real cure. And sometimes really well-meaning people will say, okay, here's some oil. Maybe this will help. And, and then they get in the way. And when somebody really, really loves you, they're going to say the only cure is Christ. The only one that can fill your oil is you and your relationship with Christ. You can't count on others to do it for you. So the wise virgins had some extra oil just in case. That's for the times that we run out, for the times that we're dry or overwhelmed or discouraged. In the life of a believer— you never have to live without the oil you need for that moment. Let me say that again. In the life of a believer, you never have to live without the oil you need. You're never going to be without what you need. You need joy, Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You need peace, Philippians 4.7. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You need strength, Psalms 22.19. But you, Lord, don't be far from me. You are my strength. But what happens is we wait until we need oil. And we're so dry and so discouraged and so overwhelmed. And then we look around and say, wait, I've got nothing to draw on. And then in our tired, worn out, weary state, we could just go to Jesus. We turn to people. We get more frustrated. And that's how you see people that have served God for years all of a sudden just don't anymore. Because we never have to live without, we need, without what we need. Have you ever tried trying to find something when you're really tired? Yeah. And then it's just harder and more frustrating. So we have a son. We had moved, um, I guess he was about six years old. And I don't know if it was the new house or what, but he developed this habit of sleepwalking. So I remember the first time he comes out. He's probably six, maybe seven. Oscar and I are sitting in the living room, and he comes down the hall, and Javi has this really like scary baby zombie look. You know, if you've ever seen a kid sleepwalk and like they're there, but they're not there and you don't really know what's happening. So he kind of walks down the hall and kind of robotic. And then he just comes in the family room, and just stares. So we're talking and we look over and you know, he's, got, he's like such a little nerd. He has his like jammies that come to like right here and right here. Like they're just a little too small and his belly's out and he's all like, and it was just really unnerving. So I'm like, oh, hey, Hey, buddy. And he just, nothing. 
And it took us a minute, and then I'm like, oh, my goodness, he's sleepwalking. So Oscar did what any dad would do and solved the problem. So he goes over, and he spins him around by his head and goes, try going to the bathroom. <laughs> so took him down the hall, and he went to the bathroom, and then he just put him back in bed, and he's like, probably just need to go to the bathroom. Like, that was really weird. And then for the course of several years, he would kind of wander out. I'd see him go to the door. It would make me panicked. He's just going to wander into the backyard sometime. And then he kind of just outgrew it. But I can tell you, whatever he was looking for, I don't know if it was the bathroom. I don't know if it was us. I don't know. He was never going to find it because he wasn't fully awake. Friends. Hear this in the spiritual. You're never going to find what you need in Christ when you're not fully awake. When you fall asleep thinking, I have more time, I have another Sunday, I have another year, just a little more time with this addiction, just a little more time with this sin, just a little more time with this thing that I'm not supposed to have, just a little more time in my selfishness, just a little more time. You'll never find what you need unless you realize you need it right? When we're weary, it can be so hard to find the refreshing that we need. So that's why we fill our tank every day. I know that sounds like such a no-brainer, but here's what happens so often. You know, I've had a bad week. We should probably go to church. Y'all, that's great. I'm so glad you're here. You know, you can come on good weeks too, because church is every Sunday. Oh, we've, we're just, we've had a rough week at work. I'm going to Wednesday night service. That's great. It's every Wednesday. I, oh, look, because I can. I'm going to come to church and go to Sunday school and get a little bit of the word, but then I'm going to leave and not stay for the whole service because I just need enough oil. I just need some drips. I just need enough for it. I got just, it just dripped on me just enough. I'm good. Friends, that's not building up enough that when you get weary and discouraged, when you say, I'll turn to God when I need something. That's what these ladies did, right? I'm here with my lamp. I'm blending in. I'm going through the motions. Here I am. But when it came time and they looked, oh, there's no oil. How'd that happen? I haven't been to church in three months. I haven't been to life group since Noah built the ark. I haven't read my word. I haven't prayed. I haven't worshiped. Now, how in the world did I run out of oil? Friends, I can tell you that when you don't invest in a relationship, it becomes this slow leaking, right? It's not like all of a sudden your oil just gets poured out. Sometimes it might. But for most people, it's just a slow leaking. It's a slow compromise. It's a slow, I used to be a little hungrier for that. I used to push through for that. But now, eh. It's a slow leaking. It starts like this. There's there's this other good thing. And this other good thing makes me really, really happy. And this, this other good thing, yeah, it interferes with my relationship with God, but it makes me happy. And since happy is the goal, right, that's what we're living for, then I'll just trade oil for this thing. I'll I'll just trade having my children in the house of God on Wednesday night for an athletic event because that makes me happy. This makes me holy. Holy doesn't always make me happy, so I'll go with happy, but then I'll wonder why after four years of coming to church four times a year, my senior graduates and says, I don't believe in God anymore. Friends, because when happy is the goal, you happy feels a little like oil when it happens. Happy feels like this is okay, this is good, this is all right. And then your head hits the pillow at night and the thoughts start racing and you know, I don't have the oil I used to have. But why not? I'm so happy. And so we start to trade what God intended for holiness. Now hear me, those things aren't bad until they start to compete with God. It becomes evil when you're making a choice and it's easier. I'm just going to say this. When it's easier for you to say yes to the things that make you happy than yes to the things that make you holy because one comes at a higher tag, price tag for you personally than the other. Then it becomes an evil thing. When it starts to compete for your affection and you start to let it have it. So it's our job to fill our own tank, right? The word used for lamps here is actually lampos. 
And that's really more of a lamp. Like when I first researched it, I pictured like the old Bible times lamps. They look like the genie in a bottle kind of lamps and they would fill it with oil. But this word is actually more of like a torch. So it's pretty big. And they would have a rag or a rope that they would soak in oil and then they would attach it to this torch. And then they would hang these torches on post. It was a pretty huge lamp. It wasn't really like a small personal lamp likely. And so what happens is when they go to travel, they pour the oil out. So they take the oil that um, was already in the lamp, you know, they had it lit, they pour it out, they'd store the oil separately. So when they first get somewhere and they light the lamp, there's no oil in it. It's just residual effect of the oil from the last time it was lit. So it's, an, it's a lamp that works initially because there's some residue. So there are a lot of biblical scholars that would believe that these virgins did not run out of oil. They just didn't pack any. And when they first lit it, it looked bright because it had some residual effect. Friends, what that looks like in our spiritual walk is, tell me something good that, that God has done for you. Oh, in 1994, I went to this service, and that's the last time that I had some oil in my lamp. Friends, tell me something about your walk with God. Well, one time when we had this one pastor or one time in this one worship service and it's residual effect, there's not been fresh oil for so long that you're counting on yesterday's oil to keep lighting the fire today. It looks like this. Tell me something about the goodness of God, and you enter into a conversation. I'm not saying we can't celebrate the goodness of God from 25 years ago, but if that's the last time that you experience the goodness of God, then you might be counting on a little residual effect on that rag instead of fresh oil that God has for you today. So what happens is we come with a, a rag that's a little damp. You know, Christ saved me a long time ago. I was in revival service and it was pretty powerful and once someone prayed for me and it's just this residual effect and I haven't really studied scripture I haven't really prayed I don't really have a personal relationship with Christ but I come into church and they sing songs and I feel okay I feel some peace I feel some joy and then I leave and I'm still suffering mental anguish I'm still battling relationship issues I go home and in the in our home there's not a whole lot of difference between probably an unsaved person's home, but hey, I have a little residual effect on this oil. So I can come to church and I can light my lamp and it kind of almost looks like everybody else's. But friends, you know the last time that you had an encounter with God that was personal, that was between you and God, that filled your lamp with oil, and it does not take a prophetic conference, it does not take a special guest speaker, it does not take a Hillsong concert, it takes you in your prayer closet with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's super important that we push into that. So the virgins wake up and they say, I'm out of oil. (laughs) And their reaction is to go buy what they should have already had. And this is what really illuminated to me in this scripture, that that represents a human convention that we trade for a supernatural connection to the bridegroom. Let me just go buy what I should have already packed. Connection happens through relationship, and it's not just about access, but true connection is about authority. True connection is about authority. It's not just about getting into the wedding. It's about having a seat at the wedding table with your name on it. Friends, so often we settle for access. We settle for being near the presence of God instead of pushing into the authority, which means we're not just near it, we're in it. And we're not just in it, we carry it. So when I walk into that store and I see that person that's struggling and they look sick, I don't have to say, wow, God can heal them. I can walk right over and say, hey, I have a little access and authority. Can I pray for you today? Can I lay hands on you? Can we believe for supernatural healing? It looks like this when someone calls and says my marriage is on the rocks you don't say I have access you say I have authority let me come and break those strongholds in Jesus name let's get you in the house of God let's disciple you in truth you can have better for your life but friends we settle for access you know why because it feels good it's like when I lived on Kauai looking at the ocean but you know I would not get in it I tried a few times and I was not cut out for that ocean 
Okay. I grew up in Southern Indiana, so we'd vacation at Florida a lot. And I thought I can swim good. And definitely I can swim in the ocean. I've done it my whole life. It's easy. And then we go to Hawaii, which I quickly discovered is the most remote place on the planet. It's the most secluded place when you look at the globe, which means that there's the most stretch of water with no land to break it up. So the waves are not Florida waves. <laughs> so I'm like, this is great. Oh, look how high they are. And the first time I got in, I literally got out with sand in my mouth. And that had not happened to me in Florida. And a few more tries of that, and this is what I found. Ankle deep, I really love the ocean. <laughs> I mostly love it just looking at it. And I was fine because I didn't want to drown and never be found again. <laughs> so I'm ready to meet Jesus. I just didn't want to go like no one knows for sure what happened. <laughs> she went swimming and we never saw her again. And that's what so many settle for in their walk with God, having access, looking from afar without really entering into relationship. And it robs them of so much of the joy that God has because the church now more than ever is desperate for a church that will rise up in power and authority and take captive the fear and chaos that the world talks about so much. So if the hopeless don't know where you get your hope, we're doing it wrong. Y'all, if people know who you're voting for, but they don't know who you're living for, you're doing it wrong. Okay? If... If I know what you believe politically, but you don't lay your hands on me and pray for me, you might have it a little out of whack. I'm just saying, friends, now more than ever, the world needs us to have oil in our lamps so we can light the way for the bridegroom when he comes so people don't miss it. But when we live like the world every other day and then we come into church on Sunday and we dress it up for a few minutes and we walk out and we live the same way, our marriages are broken, our finances are lost, we are just as confused and scared and, and in just chaos as the world Friends, there's no oil in our lamp, and when the bridegroom comes, how are they even going to know he's here? Do you hear what I'm saying? When, when how will the world ever know that supernatural peace could be theirs? How will the world ever know that they can face something that looks impossible and say from the mountain, go from here to there, and it will? How can they ever know if we don't light the way because we've settled for a little bit of access? The truth is, it's the oil reserves that keep our lamp burning. I don't think that God is faithful. I know that God is faithful. When I look back over my life and I see time and time again, when I see an infant abandoned with no adoption plan in an adoption agency in the worst, ugliest circumstances, and God plucks that life up and says, here's a Christian family. Well, you will grow in the fear and admonition of the Lord. When I see that same woman sitting in a hospital room being told it is hopeless, not only will your child not survive, but neither will you. And nine months later, a perfectly perfect young man was born, and still I'm here. And then I see where my mom had not one, not two, but three stage four cancer diagnosis and time and time again, God showed up faithful in hospital rooms when I would come down the stairs at six in the morning and I would see her with her word open reading, bald and so full of chemo that her skin was wet. And I never saw the back of God. I never saw him turn around. When I see time and time again, grandparents who would weep for me in their room at night when I would sleep next door and they wouldn't just say, I pray for you every night. I would hear their pray prayers echoing off the wall. And when they got to my name on their prayer list, their voice would get a little louder. And the things they claim for me are still promises I live in today. Friends, I know that God is faithful because he has never once abandoned me. So when I look at my oil, I know why it's there. And on a bad day, there's reserves because I know that God is faithful. I know that God is faithful. That's how that works. Listen, Kurt, in 1996, when he told you to start praying for people and you started praying for people in your future and now we're standing in the blessings of those prayers, that's oil in your lamp, right? Jen, when you led generations of young women to the Lord and now they're serving God and raising their children to do the same, that's oil in your lamp, right? Pastor Dan, Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday, and you're speaking truth and life into those kids, and then one of them grows up and says, I'm, I'm going to be a youth pastor. That's oil in your lamp, right? 
when, when Blake and Stacia, the Sunday you got baptized and you said, I'm starting over and look at you all this time later, that's oil in your lamp right? It's oil in your lamp. And then when you say, this is getting a little hard, this one's a little rough, you pour a little more oil and you say, my God, I don't just sing words. I don't just study words. I know that they're real. It's a lie for me. And so I have the oil that I need for today because yesterday God was faithful and tomorrow I know he'll be faithful. So when something comes in to try to threaten that, it's not up for grabs. Because God is faithful. And it's really not hard, friends. How do we not run out of oil? Ooh, it's the easiest thing. Know Jesus. Pray. Get in your prayer closet. I don't care if it's two minutes. I don't care if you're driving down the road. Start somewhere. Start somehow and just pray. Have a conversation. Worship. Find a song you like. Find a, let let me tell you something. Sunday morning worship is a whole lot more refreshing when it's not your only worship service, okay? So years ago, I had this friend who got this wild hair that we should work out together. We're still friends, but whatever. And I was like, sis, you don't know me at all. But she really, really wanted to try out this class, and fine, whatever, I'll go. But the truth was, it was the only time I was going to exercise all week, and I wasn't really into it, clearly. So I showed up a little bit late. I would stand in the back. I would mostly make jokes, and then we would go out for chips and salsa, which was the whole reason I was there, right? And so it wasn't all that effective. (laughs) I can't imagine. I feel like the teacher wasn't doing a good job, right? I feel like if the teacher had a greater anointing, I could have come in half-hearted, kind of committed, thinking about the chips and salsa, and still it would have worked, right? If only they were better. Oh, friends. (laughs) When we say, I'm going to half commit to this thing, and I'll go 10% of the way. By half, I mean, I'll show up. And then you, and all the power and anointing to bring me the rest of the way, Friends, I'm going to tell you, you're going to leave and you're going to look at your lamp when you get home and say, it's not as full as I thought it would be. You know, maybe if I went to a different church, they would have more oil. Maybe if we had a, if they had sung this song. Friends, you want oil in your lamp? Get in your prayer closet. Start worshiping. Start praying. Start studying the word. Start ask, asking the Holy Spirit to eliminate it to you personally. And let me tell you, you know the mark of a life that's, okay, look, last week we had our new members class. And I know you guys haven't had a chance to really get to know one another. But there's a couple in this class, and I'm just going to tell you, even though they might get a little embarrassed, but Lynn and Heather, they live their life pouring oil out. And so as people start telling their story, it's like, why are you here? Lynn and Heather, Lynn and Heather, Lynn and Heather, Lynn and Heather. They did this. They prayed for me. They said this. And it did not even kind of surprise me. Not even kind of. Because the little bit that I've gotten to know them, I know this. When they're coming in, when they're going out, their lamp is full of oil. When they walk through the doors, they're ready to worship. When they walk out, friends, we can all have that same authority when it comes through relationship. I don't need to come in on Sunday and put on a happy face and say, I'm here to play church for a couple of hours. That's not what gets us the oil. Look at these virgins just standing outside waiting for the bridegroom, going through the motions. What gets you the oil is real relationship. A few weeks ago, pastor preached on breakthrough, and then I think he said something like, we were going to pray for you, but I didn't because I'm, I'm contending for a marriage of people that I dearly love, and it is on the rocks, and it is looking hopeless. And I had had a night where I was wrestling in prayer for this couple. And so when he said breakthrough, I thought, yes. I am claiming that authority, and I came to the altar, and I just began to weep and intercede for this couple, and I forgot for a minute, hear me, that we're pastors. I forgot for a minute, because you know what? My oil is my responsibility, and when they call me and they say, I don't know what we're going to do, I want to tell them, hey, this word was preached, and I knew it was for you, and I grabbed it and started praying over it, and friends, hear me. You can... Have all the oil you need. There is no reason that you would ever run on empty. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up if you would. 
when you allow his presence to fill that oil reserve back up. But would you just stand to your feet with me this morning? And just close your eyes just for a minute. They're going to prepare to lead us in a time of worship. And friends, I'm, I've been in church a long time, so I know there are some of you today that you're so full of the joy of the Lord that you're like, hallelujah, I got all the oil. I got, I got reserves on reserves on reserves. I got 15 lamps, not just one. I've been in the presence of God every day. Hallelujah, bless it. But there are others in here that are saying, I'm here. And, and my lamp might be a little dry this morning. Maybe there's even some residue left on the rag from the good things God did a while ago. But here I am saying, God, I need fresh oil. I need a fresh touch. I need to hear from you today. Maybe there's some of you that when you look around, you say, I'm good. I've got oil. But, you know, when you think about lighting it for the world to see, maybe that's something I could do a little better. When I think about my friends and my family that don't know Jesus, am I making him famous? And I'm making sure that they know who he is and what he's done. So I want us just to take a minute. They're going to lead us in a song of worship. And as they do, I'm going to give you just an opportunity to respond. And listen, we said it already. The oil in your lamp is up to you. And as if I could, as a pastor who loves you dearly, I would drag you to the foot of the cross and cover you with all the oil I could find if I thought that I could do that for you. There isn't a mom or a dad in this room that wouldn't do that for your kids if you could, right? There isn't a man or woman of God that wouldn't do that for your lost friends and family. The oil in your lamp is your responsibility. But there is a broken world that desperately needs a church to light the way so that they can find the hope and the peace and the joy that we know. And so as we worship, I'm going to encourage you wherever you find yourself today to push in and ask God for fresh oil in his presence. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you today that there's fresh oil. That God, there is a promise in your word for whatever we're facing today. That, God, your people lack nothing. Whatever they need, they find an abundance in you. And so, God, we lean into your presence today. Lord, we confess of distractions that robbed us of the joy of our salvation. Lord, we repent and we say, God, our hearts and eyes are fixed on you. We don't want a poor substitute for the presence of God. We want who you are and all that that means for our life. And, God, we pray for fresh oil and boldness to let it burn as bright as the world needs to see so that they can find their hope, their peace, their salvation in you too. God, I thank you for your word over your people today, that God, whatever we need, we can find in your presence. And Lord, I pray as they leave, they find themselves blessed, full of joy, and knowing exactly how loved they are by you. In Jesus' name, amen.